Hey everybody, it's great to see you today. Today is September 14th and this is Living Power, your online Bible study. Today we're starting the book of Esther. It's a just a it's a great story, a historical story about the Jews and the Jewish people and um, we'll be here for the next two days, so three days in the book of Esther. And I wanted to let you know there is a movie that's been produced that I think is very good, and it does help to bring the story to life. It's called One Night with the King. So if you have a Netflix um, account and you can watch that, um, it, it is appropriate for teenagers. So um, it, I just think it's a good um, a good thing to accompany the, the story. It kind of brings it to life just a little bit. The um, the story is filled with intrigue. It's filled with deception. There's a villain, of course. There's a hero. And um, even though the name God is not mentioned not once in this book, it is so apparent that he is um, controlling the events and just in the midst of the situation. So that's what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to focus on the reading today. I'm not going to focus on the whole book of Esther, but just the portion that we read today. And I'm going to try to point out, do you see how God is working? Do you see how God is working? So I hope that will um, bring some life to the story for you. A uh, bit of historical background. Uh, Xerxes is the king of Persia at this time, and we're in the time period of about 486 BC. He reigns over an entire kingdom that includes India, the Middle East, Ethiopia, Israel. So it's a vast nation. Um, there are some other main characters that you need to be familiar with so that you can understand the book of Esther. Vashti is his queen that he summons in today's reading and does not come. Um, Haggai, H-E-G-A-I, is the head eunuch and they castrate these eunuchs, the, the men that work closest to the king so that they don't father a um, uh, with one of the concubines or having forbid we you know the queen or anything but so they don't father children that may rise up and overtake the throne this Haggai is the uh, concubine that's in charge of Esther for her care I don't know if you noticed but when she is taken as a young girl she's given 12 months an entire year of beauty treatments before she's taken before the king so she's given fine food she's allowed to relax she probably spends much of her days strolling through the gardens she has fine lotions shampoos all, you know all kinds of things that would um, help her to become even more beautiful and we're told that she was very beautiful to begin with. Mordecai is also a Jew. She is Esther's uncle and has adopted her because evidently Esther's parents were killed when she was very young. So he in the reading today over here is the assassination plot tells Esther and they, they are able to save the king. In an earlier lesson we mentioned that these nations keep copious documentation and would have um, put this and notated this in a scroll and put it away in the king's archives. This is a very important important event that the king later recalls probably years later and uh, we it will be important in, uh, in tomorrow and the next day's reading. Esther is the, um, the she is the um, main character in the story and she's the heroine as you will later find out. Of course God is the, the real heroine but uh, Esther is the one that God raises up at this point in time to save the Jewish people. She um, is an amazing young woman that demonstrates such courage uh, against all odds. Can you imagine being taken from your home with Mordecai and being led captive into a harem. First of all, that was the first thing she had to overcome. Now, I actually visited an ancient harem in Istanbul when I was there, and it's, um, from what I understand, it's a place of, uh, you know, lots of cat fights. And I don't mean cats, I mean women. Women that, um, beg, steal, and, and cheat, and um, are not friends to one another because 
Their whole political system is to be favored by the king, to be chosen by the king, and they do everything and anything they can, even ugly things to one another, to be seen as the favorite. Um, they're prisoners. They're not allowed freedom outside of the harem. They are um, confined into a small part of the palace. And um, in this particular harem that I went to, there were bars that looked like prison bars on the windows. We cert the king certainly wouldn't, wanted pe wouldn't have wanted other men to come in and uh, rescue girls and take them out of the harem, and he certainly wouldn't have wanted the women to be able to escape. So it's not a real uh, pretty picture. So the fact that she was, uh, she became the next queen would have given her high status and lots of privileges and would have probably been, uh, if you were taken in a harem, the only position that you would have wanted in such a place as this. And it's important to understand in the third year of his reign, um, he had this banquet and Vashti was kicked out. In the seventh year of his reign, four years later, Esther actually um, goes in and approaches him to see him. Um, so there has been a four-year time span between this. Um, actually, I don't think it was in the seventh year that Esther goes in to see him. Yes, it was. It's, it's when she became queen is when it was, when she and Mordecai soon after actually discovered this assassination plot and saved the king's life. So what we want to talk about today is what happened between these, this four-year period of time. Well, there's something that's going on historically that we read from the historical books that's not here in the Bible today, and this is what's so interesting. Um, the, there were the, the feast was a 180-day feast, some historical books tell us. That is a long time to be feasting. And very likely, there were meetings involved, military meetings involved as part of these feasts where um, uh, political advisors would come in and talk to the king. You see, Xerxes' father was, <clears throat> was off fighting the Greeks. And in uh, 47, 480 B.C. had been defeated by the Greeks. So this was, <clears throat> this was what was happening in the kingdom about the time of this feast when he asked for Vashti to come in. And Vashti says, no, I don't want to come. So the kings are disappointed because they've been defeated by Greece. And um, then in 479 B.C., Esther gains favor with the king after the defeat by Greece. So you can kind of see how God is in control and God is um, making all of these events kind of play into one another because um, the, the king is disappointed in this defeat and so he is looking for a new queen and... Um, accepting of Esther to come in and to be queen. Of course, that is God's plan to put her in that position so that she can ultimately save the entire Jewish nation. Now, one thing about the book of Esther, the story is about God does, God's deliverance of his people. That's the overarching theme here. It's also about Satan's unrelenting attempts throughout history to destroy God's people. That's also a very important point here as well. I found it very interesting that Vashti refused to come before the king, but in tomorrow's reading, or it might be the next day, you're going to read about Esther coming before the king unsummoned. You just don't do that. You can be killed, beheaded to do this because you, you, have, to, um, you have to be summoned to come before the king. Um, and when she comes before the king, she knows that he's either going to say, oh, what have you done? You're destined for death. Or he's going to raise his scepter and say, you may, you may approach. So I won't tell you exactly what happens if you're not familiar with the story. But here again, we can see that God is in control because the first time Vashti doesn't approach, and that angers him so much, that God has turned the tables 
completely 360 and now here his new wife is approaching so boldly that she has not yet been summoned. Certainly that um, um, softens his heart a little bit towards Esther and you'll see, um, notice what he offers her when she approaches unannounced. It's amazing. Now uh, Mordecai is I uh, just want you to be aware he's a he's a Jew and his great great grandfather is the one that was exiled to Babylon so that's how the family came to be here in the first place. Esther's name is Persian and her Hebrew name Hadassah is her real her real name but uh, we know that many times that their names were changed when they were exiled to Babylon and this is true of Esther as well but she was just a beautiful beautiful girl now Haman is a character that you're going to want to pay attention to he is the one that the devil uses to try to exterminate the Jewish people here so um, notice this is another example of how God is in control notice he is very superstitious. The culture in Babylon is very superstitious. Notice that he cast lots to determine the day the Jewish people should die. And he thinks that it's luck and chance that's determining the way these uh, lots are being cast, but God is the one ultimately that is determining how even that comes to pass. So Today, the, the day that they're casting the lots is the 13th month. The day that the lots determine that they should be exterminated is the 12th month. So in essence, God is controlling the fact that they have a, almost a full year. And think about that. This is another way God is in control of the story. He's giving his people, he's giving time for all of these events to play out, time for Esther to do what she needs to do, so that almost a year from now, this date has been set for their extermination, and I won't tell you exactly what happens. Notice that Haman offers, offers to pay millions of dollars that would cost to exterminate these people, and he offers to pay it himself. That's just awful. And um, and then at the end of the reading today, Esther has met has has understood from Mordecai that this decree has been established. Mordecai says, maybe this is the whole reason why you were selected, taken from my home, put in this harem, and then made queen so that you could do something to save us. Esther, you must do something. And she says, but I could die. And then she comes to realize, kind of, she resigns herself to be completely in the will of God, much like Mary does, the mother of Jesus, much later. And she just says, if I perish, I perish. But she places her life into God's hands. You know, I wonder if we could do that, if we were put in that position. Do we, uh, when we find ourselves in positions that could, uh, could we, we could find ourselves in great harm, do we just say, well, if I perish, I perish. The Lord is sovereign over my life, and I know that He is guiding these circumstances. Oh, if we could have faith like that. And the end of our reading today, we see that she's not been summoned, but she makes a decision to go before the king. And um, she fasts, and she uh, and Mordecai here express great faith in Yahweh the Lord that um, that he will save them and that they must act. So without uh, further ado, I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens, but for the next two days you're going to be reading the conclusion of the story. Watch and see, look for ways that God is intervening and is sovereign in the life of his people Israel. Well, I hope this uh, lesson has been a blessing to you today. Um, blessings to you and your family until we meet again. Shalom.